Hello, hello. Good evening, everyone. Good evening and welcome. So uh, it seems that we have uh, a lot of early comers today. That is great. It is great news. Um, thank you guys very much for being on time and thank you for, um, you know, for giving me the chance of sharing once again with you tonight. Now, uh, we are basically at the second last class. So we are very close from being done. Um, so for tonight, what we're going to be working on is basically wrapping up the, the topic that we had pending from yesterday, which is classes, stating reasons, and conditions. And once we're done with that, it is very, very possible that we might move on into talking a little bit about phrasal verbs. Uh, oh, wait. So um, phrasal verbs are very common. Like they are useful for many things in English. And the thing is that um, I consider that it's a topic that we like should reinforce a lot because it's something that um, we barely study and it's also something that we also need a lot. So English is very unique in that sense, you know, that they don't really um, create new words or have new words for different like activities or for different actions. What they do is that normally they just have like a different um add-on let's say to an existing verb they just have an add-on and that's what they do to create a new verb so phrasal verbs are born just like that they are born as a um as a alternative to use when um when we don't have a word like a specific word to mention uh, a specific activity so we're going to be um talking about that you know and how to use um, them and also the uses that they may have because different phrasal verbs can have also two uses. So yeah, English is very stingy when it comes to creating new words, when it comes to adding new words to the language. Like um, they normally just, just just go for for that, for phrasal verbs, for adding like one word to an already existing word and thus they have a new term. Um, that's also why there are so many compound, um, like compound names or nouns in English, because they have a ton of like things that, um, what they do is simply that they add like a specific section of a word and that makes the pre-existing word into a new word. So kind of tricky, but still, it's, um, something that we, are going to be covering and we are going to reinforce a little bit of the knowledge that we have regarding that topic. So um, apart from that, the question for tonight, I wanted to do something that was a bit special. And this evening, I would like to hear from you guys. What is your favorite thing about being a Salvadorian? So I would like to hear that. So what is your favorite thing about being from here, from El Salvador? So let's get started. And I think we're going to start by hearing from Lorena. So in your case, Lorena, what is your favorite thing about being a Salvadorian? I know I don't know if I, I am able to express, but I like to be to be from El Salvador, from his culture, for our people, for our uh, kind of person that we how kind of a form of being, I don't know, because I had the opportunity to travel to many countries, and I and when I had been there, I said, I know, I prefer my Salvador, really, I prefer El Salvador. And then that's why I, I don't know the, the 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 ways to explain it, but I love El Salvador, mm -hmm. and if I someone, I don't know, the last time we had the opportunity to go to live it at the United States, and we, I did, we didn't accept. Because my husband asked me, and I say no, I don't like that. I I, I prefer to live here. So it's that it's that like a, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm crazy, but I love it. All right, no, that's okay. I mean, as far as you also have, you know, the chances or um opportunities to grow, it's it's just great. So yeah, nice, very nice. Uh, now, how about in your case, Imelda? What is your favorite thing about being Salvadorian? Well, uh, my favorite thing is because we we are um, 
kind of eh, personas muy cálidas. ¿De cómo se puede decir? Welcoming, welcoming people. Uh -huh. Welcoming people and for the cuisine and the culture. And, and I am agree with Lorena because uh, sometimes people ask me if if I I could choose some country to live in another country to live and I and I say no I know <laughs> no I, I I don't change my my country I I love El Salvador all right yeah nice very nice so I see that a lot like I think I have to yeah I, I have I remember that I have I have told you guys that I love to watch like blogs from people that come and visit our country and uh, I see that you know many people have a great time here because um, when they go to like plazas or parks um, people are almost always welcoming um, Podríamos decir warm, en el caso de la palabra que usted quería decir, like warm people, pero creo que es mejor welcoming porque es más como que la palabra welcoming se utiliza cuando hablamos de personas que son como amables y um, que además nos hacen sentir verdad, eh, ¿cómo decirlo? Um, como cercanos, como si somos parte de, entonces para eso se utilizaría el welcoming. So, yeah. Um, Uh, basically, that is that is why that is uh, or that would be a thing that I have watched in many videos and how people react when they see like um, like foreigners or people from abroad. And it's great. It's great to see how, you know, we are becoming a better face around the world. And who knows, in a couple of years, maybe we're going to be top of the list of places to visit in America. Hopefully, who knows? Now, how about um, Luis, in your case, do you have anything that makes you feel proud about being Salvadorian or what would be your favorite thing about um, being a Salvadorian? Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, I think that uh, the people we are I think special for remain remain of the world. So, uh, a lot of uh, news uh, around the world, all, they always mention the people, the Salvadorian people are very happy, are very smelling, are very good people. But I, I, I can, I can see that and, and I can share that comment. But, and also I think here in El Salvador, uh, I think the, the, I like to be here is the, the distance in our, uh, to around the country. Mm -hmm. So we can go to any place. In one in, day. In, In, in a few minutes, mm -hmm. uh, short uh, way, uh, short roads, we can go to the beach, we, go, we can go to the volcano, to the mountain, and everything. That is the, I like uh, to be here in El Salvador. Okay, yeah. because everything is reachable and also because of the people, because the people are happy here. I agree. Yeah. I mean, I feel like uh, even we have, even though we have been through many things in our short story, like we're not like a very ancient country. Uh, we have been through a lot, but still, we have also managed to um, to be or to stay happy as we are. You know, we're not like one of the most prosperous countries, but our people are always um, trying to give you like their best face or their best smile. And that is nice. It is something very nice about uh, being from here. And also the thing that you mentioned, like everything is reachable. Um, you can do as many things as you want. And basically um, you don't need more than a day to travel the whole country. So yeah, that is also a very good addition to, um, to being from here. 
How about the case of, um, let's see, Leslie, in your case, what is something that you like about being a Salvadorian? Or what is one of your favorite things about being Salvadorian? Okay. <laughs> it's funny, but what I like most being Salvadorian are the word we use. <laughs> because the word? The word? Uh -huh. uh, we use because uh, our word can use many meanings. Like, uh -huh. uh, I have the chance to make many friends around the world, and they always laugh uh, about the meanings of the words can we use uh, even bad words <laughs> the feeling is different that's right ah por cierto ahora es que lo mencionan eso se lo puedo contar en español porque si sí me pasó me pasó también conocí okay. a personas ajá, de, de fuera y dicen lo mismo o sea personas españolas porque trabajé el tiempo que trabajé en Estados Unidos trabajé con, con cuatro chicas de España entonces y ellas siempre se quedaban preguntando bueno Ustedes saben, ¿verdad? Que uno tiene como formas diferentes de hablar. Una forma en la que habla con la familia y otra forma en la que ya uno habla, digamos, de forma profesional. Considero yo que la mayoría de personas somos así. Entonces, eh, con ellas, para que me pudiesen entender, yo trataba siempre de usar las palabras que fuesen más apegadas a lo que ellas conocen. No iba a decirles, por ejemplo, pásame ese chunche o cosas así, ¿verdad? Entonces hubo una vez en la que estábamos, habíamos salido en la tarde, eh, los cinco juntos, y en eso me llamó una tía. Y yo contesté la llamada y empecé a hablar con mi tía, ¿verdad? O sea, yo echando el relajo con mi tía, y ellas todas se quedaban como, ¿qué dijo? O sea, porque no entendían casi que nada, según ellas, de lo que yo estaba hablando con mi tía. Entonces, y o sea, luego me empezaron a preguntar de ahí en más, fue como que ya más, digamos, interesadas en las cosas que yo había dicho, cómo lo había dicho, por qué lo había dicho. Entonces, y si nosotros nos comunicábamos siempre así. Y yo les dije que sí, o sea, que eso es como... Hablamos regularmente, ¿verdad? Con, qué sé yo, jerga y eso. Entonces, y... Ellas se habían quedado como... Reconfundidas. Y, en una de esas, me contaron que... La palabra que nosotros usamos para referirnos al niño, la palabra cipote, ustedes saben qué significa. O saben cuál puede ser otro significado que tenga el cipote. No. ¿No? Bueno, según ellas... Animalitos, ¿cómo? No. no, no. Según ellas, el cipote es el miembro masculino en algunas regiones de España. Sí, entonces, o sea, sí, o sea, yo, yo, yo les juro que yo me quedé sorprendido. Entonces, y, o sea, una de ellas, que es de la parte norte de, de Madrid, me dijo, ¿verdad?, que en la, en la mayoría de lugares cerca de donde ella, o sea, cuando hablaban del cipote, es eso. Entonces, y, o sea, se habían quedado con eso de que, ¿por qué nosotros? Ellas siempre me decían así, nosotros inventamos el español, yo no sé por qué ustedes lo tuvieron que cambiar tanto. Entonces, y yo le decía, bueno, ¿para qué lo inventaron si querían? O sea, si querían, entonces solo se hubiesen quedado en España. O sea, no se hubieran venido para acá. Ah, pues, y ahí, ahí moría la conversación, ¿verdad? Porque, pues, sí. Entonces, pero, pero sí es algo bien interesante. O sea, el cómo... Nosotros, nosotros usamos una palabra para referirnos a un montón de cosas y entre nosotros quiero que nos entendemos, pero pues personas de fuera, difícilmente. Igual, o sea... Pues, sí, sí pues igual, igual a los mexicanos, el pito, a, o sea, el vehículo, se refieren a otra cosa. Pues nosotros decimos pito, aquí pitamos y todo eso y ellos lo toman. Igual, igual yo un día, estuve de cada en Estados Unidos un tiempo, ¿verdad? Uh -huh. Y una vez que hablando con un instructor, le digo, está, está norteando fuerte. Y me dice, ¿qué es eso? No, pues sí, está norteando. ¿Y qué? Pues, no, bueno, ya le esto ya está haciendo viento. Le digo, ah, eso sí, me fue pues, norteando. ¿Por qué dicen ustedes norteando? Ah, bueno, así se dice allá porque el viento es en el norte. Le digo. Y, pero realmente son palabras bien distintas el significado. Sí, el, aquí cerca. Okay. Por... Ah, sí, diga, Imelda. Eh, en México se, se usa mucho albur, por eso que le dan doble sentido a muchas palabras. Es cierto, es cierto también. Es bastante común, o sea, el, el hecho de que eh, traten de, de, digamos, encontrarle un significado que uno ni se lo espera en las, en las palabras o en las cosas que dice. Otras personas que son así bastante, bastante, porque igual conocí varios, son los colombianos. 
yo siento que los colombianos son muy, muy bromistas, o sea, que es como que eh, a todo lo que uno dice tratan de buscarle el, do Uy, perdón, el doble sentido, entonces, y no sé, o sea, siento que todos sí. los colombianos que conocí casi eran, eran así. En ¿Sí? mi caso, eh, como yo siempre eh, he estado en, en cursos internacionales, perdón, pasantías y voluntarias y todo eso, uh -huh. y siempre soy la única salvadoreña, a ellos les daba risa porque me decían que, eh, por ejemplo, los argentinos dicen ellos que son muy mal criados, ¿verdad? Uh -huh. Pero realmente cuando ya yo les estaba enseñando las palabras, ellos me decían... Sí, no se nos acercan. <risa> Usted tiene forma de decir como, es que sí, una cosa puede ser acá en El Salvador, sustantivo, predicado, sujeto. <risa> Entonces siempre les daba risa, así y me dicen, no, es... sí, es cierto, ustedes son más mal criados que nosotros. Y yo, bueno, así no se pueden confundir. O sea. Pero, es bien, o sea, es que de verdad uno se siente como poderoso hablando en su jerga. Sí, de hecho. Es algo de... que en inglés no se puede hacer. Es bien difícil porque, o sea, sí es cierto que a veces hay una que otra palabrita que cambia, ¿verdad? Pero en inglés es bien, bien complicado. Sí existe también para las personas morenas, pero o sea, el problema es que ese normalmente es visto como el broken English. O sea, como si um, es un idioma, digamos... No reconocido. En nuestro caso, o sea, la jerga o la forma en la que nos comunicamos o la forma en la que decimos algunas cosas es de cierta manera más reconocida que la forma en la que se comunican las personas de color. Porque, o sea, sí es algo que es bien complejo también el aprender a, a usar esa jerga. El problema es que bueno, nosotros, las cosas que decimos, como que tenemos una forma de explicarla. Decimos, oh, digo esta palabra para referirme a esto otro porque el español es bien extenso. En cambio, en inglés, es como que las palabras que ellos usan, es bien, bien difícil explicarlo. Yo recuerdo que a mí en la U cada rato los hipotes me preguntaban cómo, cómo decir algunas cosas, ¿verdad? Más que todo así de malas palabras. Entonces, y o sea, yo sabía cómo, pero luego me preguntaban, ¿y eso por qué se dice así? Y pues, no sé, se lo inventaron y o sea, y así es. En inglés hay muchas, muchas cosas que a veces a uno lo dejan con ese simple, no sé, o sea, no sé por qué eso... ¿A alguien se le ocurrió utilizarlo de forma negativa y pues ahora es negativo. Pero sí, eh, creo que esa es una cosa bien, bien especial, la verdad, acerca de ser salvadoreño. Y eso de que, o sea, creo que tenemos las malas palabras más exageradas que hay. Porque también recuerdo una vez hubo una actividad en la escuela acerca de, de eso, de las malas palabras. O sea, y ahí estaban todos, ¿verdad? Estadounidenses y, y, y latinos. O sea, estábamos todos, todos reunidos porque pues en la escuela se hablaba español. Entonces, la única que no hablaba español era la maestra de inglés. Ella aprendía, o sea, sabía un par de cosas y parece que había dos. Um, una de cocinera y una señora que era de, um, de clase de arte. Ellas eran las tres que no hablaban casi nada de español. Pero los demás sí. Entonces, una vez hicieron esa actividad... Y la misma cosa, o sea, yo era el primer salvadoreño que iba a esa escuela, dijeron que, o sea, que yo había sido un riesgo, porque nunca antes habían llevado salvadoreños, solo habían llevado colombianos y, y españoles. Entonces, eh, cuando yo escribí, la tremenda palabrota, ¿verdad?, que llené un montón, entonces como tres renglones, me dijeron, o sea, que si de verdad eso era una sola frase, y yo, pues sí, sí, la usa la gente a veces, se tarda un gran rato ofendiéndolo a uno, pero pues sí, la verdad sí, o sea... Se toma la molestia de pasar sus cinco minutos ofendiéndolo, pero es una sola. <ríe> así que, o sea, pasa. Y así que, y maleducado. Y con una palabra. Maleducado y orgulloso. Sí, la verdad. Así que, súper. Bueno, ok. Uh, moving on. Let's, sorry that we took so long uh, just discussing this. But yeah, um, now, how about we hear from Abby? In your case, Abby, what is something that makes you feel proud about being Salvadorian? Uh, I don't know proud, but I like very much, very much the food because when I go to other countries, even if I eat ice, then it's not a... Como no sabe igual. So when I go out in any country, I miss much the food. Okay. Nice. Interesting. Very interesting. And uh, yeah, I mean, um, things that happen. 
things are not the same when um, you are like in a different place. There are variations on the way some things are are cultivated and stuff like that. So yeah, it uh, it is what something that makes you miss the country. So yeah, great. All right. How about uh, we hear from Gabriela? In your case, Gabriela, what is something that makes you feel, um, or what is your favorite thing about being Salvadorian? Me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, my favorite thing about being Salvadorian is that we face up for every difficulty that is in front of us. I mean, uh, I saw that people in other countries doesn't try to, to continue working if something is difficult. Mm -hmm. They just try another stuff, but we have that characteristic that we, we are continue working. Um, en de pupusas, of course. <laughs> Se habían tardado mucho en mencionarlo. Se habían tardado <laughs> mucho. But yeah, that's something that also makes you feel, uh, you know, proud about our country. Because that's true. In many countries, uh, probably also because um, they think that uh, getting help from the government is like an obligation that the government has. And I think it should be in some cases. But some people or some peoples, because we can also use that word in plural, um, so some peoples are kind of accustomed to the fact that whenever they have like a problem, they can seek for, um, for help on, on like the government. And that's what, something that happens very often when there are like natural disasters, they simply just stop doing what they're doing and they expect the government to help them with everything. But here it's like, even with situations like what happened with the pandemic, I felt so proud by seeing at like how people in reinvented themselves. Like some people opened new businesses, um, some others generated new ways of carrying out their business. So it was like, you know, great to see how we didn't really give up. Like it was the thing that made us um, like make decisions, take um, some chances or different chances, but we still made it. So that's something that makes you feel, you know, proud honestly and uh it's something that is very very good about about the people in this country now how about we hear from uh miss perla perla in your case what is something that you like about being salvadorian hi teacher hey there um i'm used pro uh, for pupusas i mean is the only good things in this country, sorry, <laughs> but yeah, I have to be sincerely. Uh -huh. uh, uh, just pupusas is is something amazing, beautiful, delicious, everything uh, right. from from El Salvador. Uh, but in other ways, or other uh, specific things, I don't know. I mean, uh, we need to learn a lot of things to to be a better country that's also understandable how about cola champagne would you say that cola champagne is also something that is special se fue bueno yo personalmente sorry, porque... oh sorry yes how about cola champagne do you think cola champagne is also something special um from our country yes but not in <laughs> i no sé cómo decir lata Ah, así, can. No, solo en la botella. Ajá, no can con la champán. Ajá, yes. Sí, no, saben que yo nunca creí que yo me iba a emocionar al ver una con la champán, se los juro. Eh, o sea, me, me refiero a antes, antes de, del tiempo de la pasantía. O sea, yo a veces, de, de hecho ya ni tomaba soda en esos días, o sea, era como que ya X. O sea, ya no, no sentía emoción por ninguna de las sodas de la cascada. Y una vez, estando en Estados Unidos, una de las familias con las que, con las que yo estaba, eh, me invitaron a almorzar. Yo ya no vivía con ellos, ya, ya vivía en, en, en otra casa, entonces, pero me invitaron a almorzar. Y recuerdo que cuando llegué, el hombre de la casa me dijo, ¿verdad? Que, o sea, había, 
ido a una tienda hispana y que había comprado un par de cosas que me quería preguntar si eran de verdad de acá. Entonces tenía nachos de los nachos de Diana, esos no me gustan, así que por eso no me emocioné. Este, tenía jalapeños, tenía troctric, por eso sí me emocioné, este, porque esos sí me gustan. Pero lo que más me emocionó fue cuando vi la botella de cola champán, y más que era la botella de cola champán de cuando yo estaba chiquito, o sea, aquella que era con azul, rojo y, y, y blanco, no sé si ustedes se acuerdan, pero o sea, la versión más vieja, porque de hecho, en Estados Unidos, no sé por qué, porque también me pasó eso, lo vi eso en California, no sé por qué en Estados Unidos los productos de aquí los venden con los diseños de antaño, o sea, no los venden actualizados. Si ustedes se acuerdan de aquella forma de empaquetar los churros de Diana cuando venían en bolsitas transparentes, pues en Estados Unidos así los ven, bueno, al menos los vendían cuando yo estuve allá. No sé ahora, ¿verdad? Si ya habrán actualizado eso. Pero considero yo que es más para apelar también a la nostalgia. Supongo que por eso ha de ser, ¿verdad? Que quizás es el diseño que pues la mayoría de personas que ahora viven allá conocieron en algún momento y pues por eso mismo ellos lo venden de esa forma. Pero... Eh, yo me acuerdo que yo esa botella de cola champán la agarré y salí de la casa, le fui a tomar fotos, o sea, y le, o sea, me emocioné tanto y después lo malo fue que ya no sabía igual, o sea, estaba como, como decasificada, entonces sabía raro, pero igual estaba, estaba buena. La otra cosa que me emocionó fue que me dieron una michelada. Sí, chévere. Sí. Eh, eh, about the cola champán, uh -huh. eh, all the kids that come uh, here to El Salvador like a tourist in, in, in I I have the, the experiences the to to get a relationship with them with with uh, kids like uh, eight to twelve years mm -hmm. all of them like the cola champán they they never uh, never uh, drunk that Uh, that uh, soda before that, that drink that that soda uh -huh. and they always uh, very happy here to to drink that cola champán all yeah. of them all of them yeah and i know and now it's it's funny because now that i when i mean as as, as uh, when i came back from from that thing um i started to appreciate cola champán a little bit more because i was like you know it's it's something great it's i mean it's a, a a flavor that i think no other soda has so yeah it, it's a great way to go <laughs> it's a great way to go so yeah uh well one last person let's hear from Ciro. in your case Ciro, what is something that you like about being salvadorian Oh, that's great. Delicious juice. The basic horchata, or is there a specific one? Because we have horchata de morro. Horchata de morro con oh. arroz. Okay, yeah, I was, I was, I was going to ask that because I mean we have so many versions nowadays that, like you know, people prepare horchata in so many ways that um, it's like important sometimes to ask like what ingredients do you like in your chata but yeah my, my mother my mother era, uh, uh, was especially the made or chata the morrow um, great that's nice yeah. yeah my mom was basically the same case as well because i think that she, since she passed i have only tried or chata de morro like two times i think so yeah that's great nice So, um, thank you guys very much. It's great to know that, uh, um, you know, that you like the country and that you like some things about it. Uh, now, as I said, we're basically only going to be wrapping this up with the classes stating reasons and, um, and con, um, sorry, and, uh, conditions. And uh, basically if we have time, we're going to talk about the phrasal verbs as well. So last night we took a look at three of these ones, which we're in, even if considering that and as long as. So once again, as a review, we know that even if introduces a condition that does not influence the main clause, which means that what is said after we uh, pronounce, even if is not going to have like a direct influence in the main clause. So it's not going to, um, 
it's not going to change the meaning of the main class, even if it's basically just an explanation, just like an example that we provide when we use um, this class. Now, considering that, in, in this case, it introduces causes and reasons that explain the main class. So here, what I said yesterday was that um, what we do is that um, when we use this, um, this class or when we say considering that, we are talking about something that is going to provide further explanation or a deeper understanding of the basic phrase or the main class or the main um, sentence in this case. So basically that's when we use considering that. And as long as we uh, use it to introduce a condition in which the main class depends. What this means is basically that when we use as long as, we're going to um, to mention something that is going to affect directly the main class. So the main class depends on this or needs this to happen just so it is possible. So as long as is going to be basically a need for the main class to have a meaning and for the main class to have a purpose. So the examples, the basic examples, the examples that come from the book are uh, for even if, I sometimes lie awake at night, even if I'm tired or I'm really tired. Now for considering that, I am lucky I can get by on six hours of sleep. Considering that most people need eight. Now for as long as, I can manage on five hours of sleep. As long as I take a nap during the day. So yeah, um, this one is, as I said, when we use as long as, we're going to um, to introduce an idea that is a requirement for the main class to have a meaning, to have a purpose, and uh, to be useful, if we can also refer it and defer to it as that. Now, we continue with unless. Unless introduces something that must happen in order to avoid a consequence. So unless. Unless in Spanish will be something like saying a menos que. See, unless. Now, something important is that unless normally is going to be used at the beginning of the sentence. If you can see, most of these um, classes start at the middle, right after the comma. But when we use unless, we are going to start the sentence with it. So, unless I get a good night's sleep, I can easily feel, I can easily fall asleep at school. Um, at work or even while driving. So unless I get a good night's sleep, I can easily fall asleep at school, at work, or even while driving. So we introduce it as the explanation says to intro. Um, sorry, to um, to mention something that must happen just to avoid a consequence. Entonces sería como decir verdad a menos que hagas esto va a pasar esto otro. Entonces, el unless va a funcionar básicamente como una introducción para una necesidad que nos ayudará a evitar una consecuencia. ¿sí? Si, por ejemplo, yo digo, o tenemos el segundo ejemplo acá, unless you start working harder on your assignments, you will not pass this subject. ¿sí? A menos que empieces a trabajar más duro en tus tareas, no vas a pasar este um, es, esta, este esa materia ahora aquí podríamos cambiarlo un poco podríamos decir por ejemplo you are sure to uh, to fail this subject pues para hacerlo positivo verdad porque también eh, se puede utilizar o sea positivo pero en este caso va a funcionar como negativo debido a que tenemos este unless al principio sí Sí se entiende el hecho de decir, ¿verdad? Um, you are sure to fail this subject. En ese caso no estamos metiendo ningún not, sino que estamos primero utilizando un verbo que tiene connotación negativa, que sería el verbo fail, porque se refiere a fallar. Entonces, el verbo por sí solo tiene connotación negativa. Y además tenemos el refuerzo del unless al principio. Esa oración básicamente tiene, ¿verdad? Todo lo necesario para funcionar como una oración con connotación negativa y que además eh, nos hace saber que nos vamos a meter en problemas a menos que hagamos 
lo primero que se menciona. So, unless. Um, let's say, for example, um, unless you stop uh, eating like you are doing right now, you are gaining more weight before the vacation. So, yeah, you have to stop eating as you are doing right now. You should eat you know healthier or better so yeah unless now next one up we have uh, that we can use it just in case or we can simply use it as in case so this one introduces an undesirable sense circumstance that needs to be taken into account so it's something that hasn't happened necessarily but may happen and just to avoid that we have to think about it we have to like consider it in our plans. So we have the example. I always set two alarm clocks in case one of them doesn't go off. Entonces, este básicamente si, se va a entender, ¿verdad? Como decir en caso. O sea, es como cuando eh, tratamos de evitar una situación haciendo algo antes. O sea, en caso, por ejemplo, um, no sé, si vamos a salir por decir algo, yo puedo decir, Um, mi tía tiene una copia de las llaves de mi casa en caso que yo tenga que salir de emergencia y ella pueda alimentar a mis mascotas. Just an example. So my aunt has a copy of my house keys in case I need to go out on an emergency so she can feed my pet. So that will be an example that we can use also with in case. Now, another example that we have over here is I normally ca carry a power bank just in case I run out of juice. This is totally me. This is something that I do in all of my backpacks. I have a power bank. It is something that I have uh, basically everywhere. So yeah, if you guys ever are running out of juice on your phones or anything or any device that you have and uh, you see me on the street, come by because I am going to be um, very, very possibly going to be carrying a power bank. O sea, eso es algo que, que yo sí hago todo el tiempo, ¿verdad? Eso de tener las, las baterías de respaldo. Um, primero que nada, porque me acostumbré antes cuando tenía iPhone. Todavía tengo iPhone, pero ahora tiene mejor batería. Este, pero el de antes se me moría rápido. Entonces, y por otro lado, porque también cuando estoy con mi familia, casi siempre necesitan, ¿verdad? Que les, que les pase carga. Y pues, porque ya quizás como unas cuatro o cinco veces cuando estaba en la universidad, tuve malas experiencias que me, me quedaban sin energía y pues eh, mi casa está un poco lejos de la U y a veces venía noche y era como que no tenía forma de contactarme con mi familia para que me fuesen a, a recoger. Así que I basically got, you know, the, the, like the idea of always carrying a power bank with me. So yeah. Now, one thing. El in case or just in case, ¿cuál sería más correcto? Vemos. El in case es un poquito menos dramático. Esa es la diferencia que existe. Cuando digo just in case, estoy dándole un poco de énfasis, o sea, más, digamos, como resaltando el decir, ¿verdad? Que hago esto en caso que otra cosa suceda. Pero no es necesario utilizar el just todo el tiempo. Ustedes pueden decir in case. I normally carry a power bank in case I run or use. Pero si yo digo just in case es solo por si acaso. Entonces, eh, para eso se utilizaría el decir just, ¿sí? para decir el solo. En cambio, el in case se va a entender como si acaso, nada más. O en caso, en caso de. So, yeah. Um, now, moving on. We have only if. Now, here you see that we have uh, three dots here. Or, yeah, three dots. Which means that um, they are separated. Okay, these are, um, this is a phrase that doesn't come together. They are not together all the time. They can be separated in sentences and normally they are separated. Why are they separated by? Well, it's normally by the verb. Okay, so uh, the phrase introduces a condition that must be met for the main class to be true. Entonces, tenemos que, eh, en este caso, el only if, Vamos, va, va a introducir una condición que debe ser lograda o debe ser um, adquirida, alcanzada, para que la oración principal o el main class 
sea cierto, ¿sí? Para comprobar, digamos, la veracidad del main class. So, we have, I only wake up early if I have somewhere to be in the morning. So, I only wake up early if I have somewhere to be in the morning. So, if you don't have nowhere to be in the morning, it is very possible that you're not going to wake up early. So, that is basically, um, uh, you know, the, the, the idea that you use only if when you're introducing an idea that um, is going to be true when you mention that specific thing. So, yeah, I only wake up early if I have somewhere to be in the morning. The next example, you will only make your dreams come true if you persevere. You will only make your dreams come true if you persevere. So, um, alguna duda que tengamos con estos porque me gustaría escucharles en ejemplos que ustedes mismos generen. Sí, vamos a, creo que esta va a ser la última vez que nos dividamos en pequeños grupos, así que quiero que tomen nota, ¿verdad?, de cuáles son las que tenemos. Sería el even if, considering that, as long as, unless, in case, and only if. Entonces, nos vamos a estar dividiendo en grupos pequeños para trabajar en oraciones. Solamente tenemos que hacer una por cada uno, ya que estas son un poquito más complejas. Um, pero, una vez más, como les he dicho desde el principio, la idea es que podamos compartir, que podamos practicar con los demás. Así que uh, vamos a estar trabajando en esto en este momento. So we have, as I said, even if, considering that, as long as, um, unless, in case, and only if. So do you guys have any questions before we get into the breakout rooms or is everything clear? All right, so I understand that we are clear. Um, this time around, we're going to be uh, making up only two groups. We're going to be separated in groups of seven people, so it's not like that much. But yeah, um, we're going to have around seven minutes to create these examples, and we're going to come back to share what we have created. So um, breakout rooms are going to be open now, and you guys can start creating your sentences. I don't know if the first one could be like, um, I get up early every day, even if I don't have anything to do. Yes. Who will uh, take notes? Maybe, because he's going to ask. But who is going to? Me. me. I'm okay. afraid, yeah. Yes, I do Pilates every day, even I feel tired. Oh. I have an example with Evan and yes. Evan throw is was raining. We decided to go for the hike. And um, can you repeat it, please? <laughs> I didn't. Get... Okay, Evan throw is going to be on vac. We're going to be on vacation. Uh, as long I... as there are the. I have one. Okay. I have one when, with uh, as long as I okay. can finish all the project as long as you help me. As long as you help me. Okay. Mm. 
¿no de? We're going to We... be on back. Okay, okay, okay. Give it. I'm sorry. Uh, no I have one with just in case. Okay. I will cook just in case if you don't want to. <laughs> Please. It is missing just one, right? Considering and only. Has to be two, four, seven, six sentences, no? Considering no. Sorry? The considering no, you see. No. Maybe we're I, going to be. Mm -hmm. Tell me. But it's weird that I'm not tired, considering that last night I didn't sleep. Would you repeat that again, please? It's weird that I am not tired, considering that last night I didn't sleep. Okay. Now, only, no? I only travel on vacation. If somebody pays me the... <laughs> the, 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 ticket. <laughs> the ticket, yeah. We finished. Okay. I think one, two, three, four, five, six, six, and I have six sentences. Yeah, we made it. Yeah. <laughs> Apply done again. <laughs> okay. Bueno, el profe se fue de vacaciones. No, just kidding. So, um, I was able to hear that you guys were, you know, having more interactions this time. So that's amazing. That's basically the idea behind it, you know, that you provide your ideas and um, that we get to share what we, what we know. And uh, that is great. So I noticed that from the breakout rooms, the ones that have the examples tonight are going to be Lorena and Leslie, because I feel like you guys were the ones taking notes. Um, so I'm going to uh, ask you to read the examples you have created. Uh, and yeah, so Lorena, would you mind sharing the examples that your group made up um, for the rest of the team? Yeah, I get up early every day, even if I don't have anything to do. All right. And um, unless I finish my homework, I can go to sleep. Great. I can I can finish all the projects the project as long as you help me. Oh, that's nice. 
I will cook just in case you don't want to. Mm -hmm. Is where is where I'm not tired, considering that last night I didn't sleep. Mm -hmm. I only travel on vacation if somebody pay me the ticket. <laughs> okay, so two changes nada más. Solo hay dos, dos cambios. Eh, sería okay. en el de, um, déjeme ver, que no me acuerdo cuál es exactamente aquí. Sería para um, in case. En el caso de in case, tendríamos que cambiar el verbo en lugar de decir I will, podríamos decir I can. Sí, I can cook in case you don't want to. Porque si yo digo I will, eh, mm, básicamente okay. elimino Exacto. la necesidad de que haya una circunstancia o una circunstancia no deseada, por decir así. Porque ya estoy proponiendo directamente que lo voy a hacer. En cambio, okay. si digo I can, es como ofreciendo que yo lo puedo hacer, pero no estoy diciendo okay. lo voy a hacer. Entonces sería I can cook in case you don't want it. Y con el caso de, um, del even if, or sorry, del only if, um, Uh, tendríamos que agregar nada más el I would, sí, I would only go in vacation uh, if somebody pays the ticket or someone else pays the ticket. Entonces, el motivo para colocarlo así es que, por ejemplo, si, um, si yo digo I only if, en algunos contextos, en, alguno, en algún sentido, puede sonar como que somos demasiado tacaños. Y entiendo que tal vez no es la idea, ¿verdad? Ahora, si la idea es sonar tacaños, pues sí. Si ustedes quieren sonar tacaños, claro, pueden hacerlo así. Y, o sea, pueden hasta directamente decirle a la persona, ¿verdad? Solo voy de vacaciones y me lo paga post. O sea, pero si la idea no es sonar tacaños... Ah, ok. <risa> bueno, si, es, si es así, entonces, claro, no problem. Pero si la idea no es necesariamente eso, podríamos utilizar el I would. Sí, I would only go on vacation if somebody else pays the ticket. O sea, okay. eh, lo decimos como una posibilidad. Sí, solo iría de vacaciones si alguien más me paga el, el, el ticket. En ese caso, se va a sobreentender que yo estoy diciendo que estoy quebrado. Like, I don't have money right now to go on vacation. So that is the only chance that I have. If somebody pays the ticket, I will go. But if nobody pays the ticket, then I'm not going. Okay. Um, how about your team? Leslie, let's hear your examples. Okay, the first one is I do Pilates every day, even I feel tired. Um, I'm doing well in college considering I have a lot to do in the day. Okay. I can work well as long as I have a sleep and meet them well the day before. And I'm super competitive in everything unless I'm not interested. I have only that. Ok, en la del unless, eh, sería mejor si empezamos con el unless. Unless I am interested, okay. I can become very competitive. Creo que eso sería como al revés. Sí. Ah, ok. Pero, okay. ajá, el resto, muy bien. Great. I will so, fix it. Thank you. No, that's ok. So, uh, nice. Sounds great. Ok, so, uh, we have some very good examples, guys. It's great, you know, to see that uh, we had had the chance to work together. It's nice also to, um, to see that you kind of got the gist of like what is the idea behind the breakout rooms that we get to share and we get to work together um so yeah now uh for this occasion as i said previously we are going to talk a little about phrasal verbs before we close the the, the class for tonight we're going to cover some of the phrasal verbs i know that some of them are common and maybe you already know some of them But there is, of course, of course, a chance that you don't. Um, so in terms of phrasal verbs, as I mentioned at the beginning, they are simply words that are or work as compound. However, they are not completely joined together as compound nouns. That is why we don't refer to them as compound verbs. And we call them phrasal verbs because they are tiny phrases. There are some larger ones, like there are three word phrasal verbs where you have uh, um, one verb and two prepositions. And in the term or in the case of phrasal verbs, what they do is that normally we have um, one verb and one preposition. That is 
the most common thing, like that is the way in which they are built up. So yeah, here, what we're gonna see is if also we can use the phrasal verbs for people or for things. Because in the case of the first one, the first one is go off. We already saw this one uh, in one of the examples from the previous activity. So go off normally refers to an alarm. Yes, when something begins to sound, but we can also use go off to refer to things like bombs. Okay, so when a bomb uh, explodes, um, we can also refer to it as a um, go off thing. And uh, we can also use it when we have like someone in the family or someone in the group of friends who we already know is the kind of person who is easy to get angry or like they have, you know, that ease to become like angry. And uh, something happens, someone says something that makes this person mad. Um, that can also be um, be understood as go off. O sea, cuando alguien explota, cuando alguien se molesta así de la nada, también podría ser el go off. Um, y cuando literalmente también cuando algo explota, ¿verdad? Cuando hay una bomba que se activa, that is also go off. So, yeah, go off. Now, from the time my alarm clock goes off, I am beginning my workout. So this is the example that we have for the like basic meaning, which is go off in the term of an alarm is starting to sound. Now, the second one is wake up or wake someone or somebody up. So uh, wake up is simple. It is simply emerge or cause someone to emerge from sleep. So there is a difference, of course, between waking up and getting up. We're going to look at it in a minute. Now. Uh, we can use the example as I wake up at seven o'clock or you can also use it with a subject in the middle, which will sound something like she woke him up gently. So wake up is one of those phrasal verbs that can be divided. You can put a subject or something in the middle in between the two words. There are some uh, phrasal verbs that are not possible to get divided, but this one is one of the ones that you can. Um, a split. So the next one is get up or get somebody up. Now, rise or cause someone to rise from um, bed after sleeping. So uh, this verb is different from waking up because waking up is simply um, stopping being asleep. Basically, that's what happens when we wake up. And getting up is actually or physically getting up, physically moving your body, physically standing up. So that is get up. Now, we have the examples. I got up feeling tired and disoriented. Or we can also say something when we split it. We will say we got him up because we had to go to a friend's house. Ahora, importantísimo. Este him, si se fijan ustedes en cada, en uno, en cada uno de los, de los ejemplos, he puesto him. Pero claro, este him puede ser reemplazado por cualquier otro pronombre eh, de objeto, en este caso. O si no, también puede ser reemplazado por el nombre directamente. O sea, yo puedo decir, por ejemplo, I woke Julia up gently. Sí, o sea, puedo directamente, ¿verdad? Mencionar el nombre de la persona. Entonces, when we use these um, splitting phrasal verbs, we can mention the person exactly like who are we referring to or we can do it vaguely by using um, these pronouns now the fourth example we have put on or put something on so we have place a garment jewelry etc on parts of one's body so putting on is basically what we do when we have like clothing or accessories that we are wearing so we put those things on. We can also use put on with music. Um, like for example, we can um, ask someone or an Alexa or something to put on and then we mention what sort of music we want to listen at that time. Like for example, I can ask, well, my Alexa is disconnected right now, but I could ask uh, from it to put on some Bob Marley, let's say, and it will play. Bob Marley. So put on can be used uh, with clothing and it also can be used with 
uh, music and things like those. So in movies as well. But well, um, basically, guys, tomorrow, ese va a ser el tema que vamos a estar cubriendo el día de mañana, sí, para, para terminar. Eh, y quizá un poco también de los, um, de los idioms, que es un tema también bien importante. Entonces, um, basically, those are the things that we're going to do tomorrow because, well, we're it, just done with the topics. So, yeah. However, if you have any questions, anything that, you know, you would like to clarify a phrase, a word that you have seen that you would like to, to get to know what is the meaning behind it or when or how do we use it, that would be great also to share with the classmates tomorrow. Um, so, yeah. But for tonight, that's it. So thank you very much for your attention and participation in this evening's class. I hope you guys have an amazing rest of your day. And uh, well, I hope I'll see you tomorrow for our, for our final class. So have a good one and see you. So bye-bye. Okay, bye.